The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. I realized I didn't ask anybody to introduce me tonight. Um, I'm Ann Wiston Spurn, a professor of landscape architecture and planning here at MIT with a joint appointment in the architecture and the urban studies and planning department. And I'm the organizer of this lecture series, Sensing Place, Photography as Inquiry. Um, and I gave myself the last spot on the series. So here we are. This is, uh, this is the wrap up. So welcome. Uh, Welcome to the Danske Studerende. Uh, we have uh, um, gave a welcome to the Danish students who are here uh, doing a study tour, um, visiting MIT and Boston and going on to New York tomorrow. The title of my talk is To See is the Root of Idea. To see is the linguistic root of idea. For me, it is the seed. Noticing something makes me see something I hadn't seen, helps me discover what cannot be seen directly or only at a different scale from another point of view. And that prompts me to question, seek answers, and find connections among what is seemingly unrelated. Trees and wind, rock, volcano, hot spring, the formation of continents, oceans, and atmosphere. A blue-violet band rising on the horizon at dusk, the earth. Recognizing pattern, I imagine sound and force of winter wind, continental plates colliding, the earth as a turning sphere. Seeing is a creative act. Photography is to seeing what poetry is to writing, a way of thinking, a disciplined practice that produces insight, a condensed telling. Deciding where to point the camera, where to stand, I choose subject and stance. Framing the image, I place the threshold and shape the view, bringing certain features into dialogue, excluding others. I determine what should be sharp, what to blur, what should be highlighted in shadow. To print a photograph is to revisit time and place, recall light and mood, refine shades of meaning, and sometimes to find in the image things I had not seen. Photographs prompt and push my thinking. I let them speak and sort them as images first, seeking associations before translating those insights into words. To study photographs days, months, years after they were taken is to see again, to revise. The whole process from first look to final print, from single image to sequence, tunes my eye and changes how and what I see. The practice of photography leads me to attend, to enter unfolding events, to spot clues in landscape to what is there, hidden and real, in poet Seamus Heaney's words. If I'm fortunate, the world appears new, and I know where to stand. This text is drawn from the book I'm currently writing, The Eye is a Door. I adapted it as a personal statement for the exhibit of my photographs at the MIT Museum in 2004 and used it again for the current exhibit, Looking at Landscape, at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, which is up through January 7, 2007. The book is about seeing as a way of knowing and photography as a disciplined way of seeing. The author Eudora Welty best known for her short stories, was also a talented photographer. For her, she says, the camera is a handheld auxiliary of wanting to know. 
It led her to see more deeply the people and places of her home state, Mississippi, and the photographs inspired her stories. She writes, what I learned for myself came right at the time and directly out of the taking of the pictures. A double thunderclap reverberates at the author's ears. The break of the living world upon what is already stirring inside the mind and the answering impulse that in a moment of high consciousness fuses impact and image and fires them off together. For me, as for Welty, Pressing the shutter imprints a vivid memory of the image. Things I saw but did not photograph. Even images that I framed and focused but then did not press the shutter are only blurry impressions. Photography is a way to divine what lies latent in landscape and to bring it out, to give it form. The camera is my diviner's rod. I walk until I feel a tug. I pause, scan, and step back and forth, move toward the place where the, where the signal is most clear. Drawn to a feature or set of relationships, I look through the viewfinder. The camera channels and brings into focus what I feel, see, and want to know. All sorts of connections lie in wait of discovery and give out their signals to the Geiger counter of the charged imagination once it is drawn into the right field. That's how Eudora Welty put it so well. On the slopes of Japan's Mount Aso, clouds of steam and billowing smoke, smell of sulfur, cold wind blasting grit, a boulder drew me in. How to account for its rounded shape and rosy gray color, its fine-grained porous texture, so different from the rocks of the dark, jagged peaks above it. The image stayed with me hours later as the, in the heat of an onsen, a traditional Japanese outdoor bath, seeped bone deep in the brisk October air. The water's sulfurous smell and stinging heat linked volcano and hot spring, violence and repose. As I studied my photograph of the boulder months afterward and read a guide to its geology, I learned more about volcanoes, the rock's form and color, and its position far from the volcano's mouth hold a memory of water, red hot rock, fountains of fire. The rock is a big cinder, a bomb blown out of the earth when water met molten rock, where tectonic plates collide beneath Japan along the Pacific ring of fire, the birthplace of land, sea, and air. In Japan, I encountered this stand of bamboo at the foot of a steep slope between temple and garden in Kyoto's Saihoji. Downy green blue, pale green gray, a cord of color. Drawn in by the colors, noting a pattern, I was led to wonder, many species or one? Tones in succession? and to discover that bamboo is a grass that spreads by underground runners. The trunks, like single blades, are called culms. Here, roots of bamboo hold the eroding hillside. Landscapes speak to me. They're living and dynamic, not static nor silent, but full of dialogue and drama. Rocks, rivers, trees are actors, not props. I'm drawn to photograph a particular landscape as one might photograph a person, to capture its distinctive spirit, to reveal its history, to show the contexts that shape it. There are few people in my photographs, but traces of people and the stories they tell are everywhere, in the landforms they shape, the paths they make, the soil they till, the plants they tend, the structures they build the places where they dwell. I experience landscape most intensively when I photograph. I aim to see things fresh by ranging broadly, gradually zeroing in, often drawn to a detail without knowing yet what the whole is, then come to understand a whole through many details. I look for pattern, coincidence, 
and anomaly. The act of selecting and framing a view makes me see and appreciate what I might otherwise miss. Moving up and down from side to side, around, alters my perspective, separates things and brings them together, shifts emphasis. The horizontal and vertical lines of the frame make me feel the landscape's geometry, repose where the horizontal dominates, tension where diagonals predominate or where they work against the horizontal, as in the slant of wind-driven waves on the sea, along the shore, or in the trees leaning away from the wind on an open plain. Looking at the corners of the frame and deciding what to place there introduces new actors and reveals surprising relationships. Calculating time of exposure makes me conscious of light, of highlights and shadows and the gradient of tones between. Light and film impose limits in low light. Only points on a single plane will be in focus, demanding a decision about subject and significance. Subject and story emerge through this process. Each photograph embodies moments, even hours of circling scrutiny. There's much more time packed into each image than the fraction of a second it takes to expose the film more points of view than the one recorded. Thinking with a camera is a meditation on place. This is Fairlight Pool in Sydney Harbor. The place and time have great personal significance. Australia clarified my ideas on landscape and language. Fairlight, 1989, was a watershed. Landscapes don't stand still. Wind, clouds, light, and appearances are always shifting. Like most photographers of landscape, I wait for clouds to pass, light to shift, rain to stop, birds to fly by, for a crowd to arrive or move on. Looking, waiting, I learn to anticipate. When waves will break and how, where the sun will be in the sky when, what clouds portend how wind will blow and trees bend. Thinking my way into the processes that are taking place, I develop a sixth sense for when something is about to happen and I enter the flow. In those minutes and hours of waiting, I often write in my journal of sights, sounds, smells, textures. I draw maps, plans, and sections of the surrounding landscape and the drawing leads me to see more. Photographs and field notes together form the primary evidence for much of my work on landscape and language. So it was at Stockholm's Forest Cemetery in May 1990. The day was dark and rainy. I walked to the Hill of Remembrance, a rounded grassy hill rising out of undulating land with a grove of elms at the top. The wide path is steep at first, climbing eased by low stone steps, deep stone dust treads, landings every dozen steps. Then the slope tapers, steps pass between trees through an open gateway atop the hill, coming to rest just inside low walls. At the beginning of the ascent, steps are set into the hillside, so the slopes enfold the climber. At the end, frames of trees and walls enclose. There's a progressive sense of threshold, gateway, refuge. Enclosed by the low wall of stone, the hilltop provides a prospect over meadow, graves, a distant chapel, the city. Waiting, hoping for better light, I wrote and sketched. A man cycled by, a woman left. A huge hare loped across the grass. The clouds began to lift. Black smoke rose from the crematorium chimney for a few brief moments and was gone, dissipating, floating off into the sky. Then, at last, the light came, a low golden light bringing the landscape alive. Form and material shape the experience of path and refuge. All modify processes of movement and grieving. 
in agreement with the meaning its designer teller intended, assent and folded, giving form to a sorrow that cannot be told. Fieldwork inevitably reveals the unexpected and challenges assumptions. I've learned to be very cautious about writing of places I haven't visited. Uluru, Ayers Rock, is at the center of Australia, an island in a desert sea. I had hoped to climb the rock and was very disappointed when back pain forced me to abandon my, pl my plan. Instead, I walked around the base of the rock and found there a far more magical world beneath traces of water streaming off the rock were pools, a cool place alive with birdsong. Here at the rock's base are the sacred places of aboriginals, not on top. While Australia's red center is a vast desert, now a refuge for aboriginal culture, its cities hug the continent's coast. These two aspects of the country, red center and blue-green coast, are in tension in the minds of individuals in Australian culture, part of the enduring deep structure of the continent. These three photographs can stand for that quality of Australia, the place and the culture. To find a place that speaks to me is to find my subject. At first, not knowing what I wanted to discover and therefore what to look for, I found my way to such places by fortunate choice and by chance. I went to Scotland because my grandmother was born at Drummond there. I made pilgrimages to the icons of my profession, to the Alhambra and Henerolifa in Spain's Andalusia, to the Villa Rotundo in Italy's Veneto, to Blenheim in England. I went to Australia in 1988 and 1989, to Japan in 1990, and these places were watersheds in my seeing and thinking. What I saw there clarified and confirmed my ideas about landscape as language. Since then, my search has been more deliberate. Now I listen for places that sound my themes and seek them out. I search for places where the processes that have shaped them are clear. Places of worship like Uluru, Ise, and Tadeo Ando's chapel at Mount Rocco. Polemical landscapes like West Belfast. Stressed landscapes like the Sonoran Desert and inner city Philadelphia. Dynamic landscapes like seashores and volcanoes. Places engage, inspire, and challenge me when the processes that shape the landscape are distinct, where one process dominates or where two or more processes interplay, especially where they create patterns that transcend scales from microscopic to astronomical, where the congruence between human habitation and the landscape's deep structure is strong. When people have shaped and arranged landscape features to express identity and idea, particularly ideas of nature. Places whose powers has been acknowledged by diverse cultures across centuries. Places where I can sense how processes shape not the local landscape alone, but the earth and the universe, like the earth's shadow and the Pacific ring of fire. In a foreign place, I notice the strange and the alien, seek to connect them, then look for broader associations, like the undulating moss that seems to flow around the base of a tree and over its roots. Gradually, as I photograph, I sense the kinship between the paradox of the moss, fluid and still, and the religion of the Zen monks who cultivate the garden and meditate there. Later, I will see the image as a metaphor for the Japanese landscape, prone to earthquakes that liquefy lowland soils and send slope sliding, tensions between the culture's embrace of accelerating change and the value it places on continuity. Japanese gardens, particularly the temple garden, 
invite me to divine such associations. The designers compose them as metaphor, like the haiku that were conceived there. Visual thinking is my primary mode of thought, putting one word after another, one thought after another in path-like fashion is not the way I think, naturally. Writing, for me, requires a translation of images and experiences into words and phrases, then a converting of web-like, landscape-like, writing into prose to construct a line of words where sentence follows sentence and paragraph leads to paragraph. But visual thinking, my native language, is not taught in primary, secondary schools, at least not in those I attended. Art was not an academic subject. It was taught as illustration and self-expression, not as a disciplined mode of reasoning like mathematics or verbal language. I recall only one encounter with visual logic in junior high school. It was in a battery of tests taken by all eighth graders to assess our own particular aptitudes and to match them to potential careers. Among the usual verbal and mathematical tests was a test without numbers or words. We were to identify which of several diagrams was the logical next step following a given sequence of three. I don't remember my scores on those tests, but I'll never forget the conclusion, which came in a form letter that I was best suited to be an engineer, an architect, or an automobile mechanic. <laughs> All three prospects were unappealing to me at the time, remote from my own interests in language and art. It was not until graduate school in landscape architecture that I was instructed in visual language. Not until then did I even know such a language existed. I went to college intending to major in art, only to find out that in Harvard's fine arts department, one studied the history of art, not its making. As an undergraduate major in art history, I learned to see, to read works of art, drawings, prints, paintings, sculptures, buildings, but not landscapes, without the aid of written texts. Original drawings, prints, and paintings hung in pairs on the wall, confronting me each time I walked into sophomore tutorial at the Fogg Art Museum. Landscapes by Rembrandt and Van Gogh, portraits by Rubens and Ang, others by Picasso, Clay, as well as their students and forgers. I had 10 minutes to examine one pair of works, five to present my findings and reasoning. What artist, time, and place? both by the same artist or not. Study and finished work, master's work and student copy, or forgery. Art history at Harvard taught me to see more acutely, to analyze the visual image, to perceive the ideas embodied there, and to translate what I saw into words. But it offered me no way to think visually and to express my own ideas in visual images. I tried and failed to obtain entry into photography courses, but every semester there were hundreds of students applying for only 15 places. Graduate school in landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania was a watershed. Landscapes were required texts, visual images the principal medium of recording observations, of reasoning and expression. This was my first encounter with drawing as visual thinking, as a bridge from the landscape as it is to what it might become. It was a surprising small step from discerning differences of style and quality in the lines of old master drawings to reading line, shape, and structure in trees, rivers, and gardens, then a longer leap to using this knowledge to design new landscapes. Understanding relationships between process and material, form and space, in context, was key. And anomalies were clues to what that wider context was. Take the example of a wolf tree, 
a tree within a woods, its size and form, the large trunk and horizontal branches, anomalous to the environs of slim trunk trees with upright branches. It's a clue to the open field in which it once grew alone, branches reaching laterally to the light and up. With that field unmowed, unplowed, or ungrazed, younger woodland trees grew thickly together around the older tree, their branches finding light by reaching up. The older tree, engulfed by a dense woodland of younger trees no longer able to find light horizontally, sends new branches upward. Landscape is dynamic. Present context includes the past. The story of the wolf tree is part of the human story. To think visually, as art historian Rudolf Arnheim puts it, is to see visual shapes as images of the patterns of forces that underlie our existence, the functioning of minds, of bodies, or machines, the structure of societies or ideas. Visual thinking is not new, and science and art were once less separate than they now sometimes seem. James Hutton, an 18th century naturalist, saw in the landscape of Scotland ongoing processes that explained its geological history. His drawings record direct observations of the landscapes on which he based his theories. The drawings represented as evidence for his arguments in his theory of the earth, the foundation of geology. William Henry Fox Talbot invented the camera in 1839 to record what he could not draw. He was frustrated at his lack of drawing ability for it inhibited his scientific career. For him, photography was both scientific method and artistic medium. Talbot's friend, Sir John Herschel, the English astronomer and naturalist who drew and photographed equally well, coined the term photography in 1839 and described it as a joint work of nature and art, a medium with the capacity to reveal the truths behind science. When I told a historian of science a few years ago that I was writing a book about seeing as a way of knowing and photography as a way of thinking, he replied, how old fashioned, but is it? Richard Feynman, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics, describes as all visual the way he tries to bring birth to clarity, in which an inspired method of picturing precedes the mathematics. Drawing is one way to explore and bring order to what Feynman calls the initial half-acidly thought out pictorial semi-vision thing. And so is photography. In the 1930s, Claude Levi Strauss took a small Leica camera to Brazil to record in thousands of photographs his readings of people and landscapes. The text of his memoir, Tris Tropique, written years after he left Brazil, recalls those photographs. In 1942, Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead published Balinese Character, a photographic analysis in which they explain that their form of presentation is an experimental innovation undertaken to compensate for the inadequacy of words alone to describe and analyze a culture. They grouped and sequenced the photographs and texts in carefully collected, selected series within cross-cutting themes. The step from a single photograph to pairs and groups was significant, writes Bateson since juxtaposition of two different or contrasting photos is already a step toward scientific generalization. As a graduate student, I began to use photography as a research method to understand place, but employed it primarily to document qualities of place rather than to formulate and explore ideas. The photographs in my first book, The Granite Garden, Urban Nature and Human Design, published in 1984, were illustrative rather than conceptual. I wrote the book to change the way cities were perceived, designed, and built, to show how cities are part of the natural world, not separated from it, to demonstrate how they can be planned and designed in concert with natural processes rather than in conflict. 
My belief that cities are part of the natural world was based on what I saw around me. And yet, when I crafted the argument, I drew my evidence mainly from science and history. The garden is a powerful, instructive metaphor for reimagining cities and metropolitan areas. And I was appalled when my publisher wanted to use a photograph of Paley Park in New York City for the book's cover. I was afraid the readers would think the book was literally about gardens of granite. Let me find a photograph, I told them, and I called Alex McLean. That's how we met. After the publication of The Granite Garden, I was surprised by how many people, including scientists and naturalists, resisted or ignored the evidence that human settlements, including cities, are part of the natural world. I've come to realize that ideas of nature and what is natural stem from strongly held feelings and beliefs. These views are highly personal and varied, and changing them is not simply a matter of marshalling compelling verbal arguments, but of reaching both mind and heart. Photography and design are powerful aids for helping people to feel as well as reflect upon the place of humans in nature. But many designers did not see the potential. At first, where's the art? I was startled by this reaction by some to the book. If the book was about sustaining health, safety, and welfare, was it therefore not about aesthetics? The impulse to see the pragmatic and poetic as separate or even contradictory troubled me greatly, for it was a motivation to connect the two that had inspired and driven me to write the book. Human survival depends upon adapting ourselves and our landscapes, cities, buildings, gardens, roadways, rivers, fields, forests, in new life-sustaining ways, shaping contexts that reflect the interconnections of air, earth, water, life, and culture, that help us feel and understand these connections, landscapes that are functional, sustainable, meaningful, and artful. I decided to write a book about the poetics of city and nature, one that would fuse function, feeling, and meaning, and plan to derive this theory from the places that exemplified it. How to begin to define such an approach? I turned first to my own photographs as primary data and sifted through hundreds of them, let them speak, sorted them as images sought connections, insights. Gradually, through many juxtapositions, patterns emerged. The result was a series of six pairs of photographs arrayed from the wild to the urbane, vernacular to high design, each embodying an engagement of natural processes with human, social, and cultural processes. Each of these photographs and each pair was the germ of an idea glimpsed but not yet formulated. Once selected, I began to tease out in words the image's import. Much of this early writing is in my book, The Language of Landscape, as are these six of the original 12 photographs. Avebury, England, 1984. Avebury was an important settlement in Neolithic Britain, located along the Ridgeway, a major trade route across southern England during Neolithic and Bronze Ages. And this is the Ridgeway you're looking at here. Between 2500 and 2000 BC, a series of stone monuments were constructed at Avebury of sandstone foreign to the native chalk downs. These stones were placed here more than 4,000 years ago, part of a processional avenue leading to the stone circle of Avebury. Dinan, France, 1978. In Dinan, a medieval town in France, an arc of poplar trees between a level plain of accreted sediments and a forested hillside cut by water flowing marks the sweeping meander of the river Reims. The arc, a line inscribed deliberately on the landscape, is an image of that sweep. 
In the abstraction and echo of the horizontal form in the vertical dimension, the experience of the river is intensified. On the riverbank, looking back toward the ramparts, individual trees planted in a tight row along the river assert their own quirky growth, more apparent in contrast to the regularity of their placement. The Alhambra, Spain, 1984. Water imbues this small enclosed patio physically and symbolically. It spills from the fountain onto pavement, its sound amplified by surrounding walls. Water puddles on the stone floor, evaporates, and cools the air. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. From whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Like this verse from Ecclesiastes, the patio de la reja is an eloquent statement about the qualities of water, a poetic description of the hydrological cycle. Small river-worn pebbles, each embodying the action of water over time, are set in packed earth that permits water to seep beneath them to irrigate the roots of the cedar trees planted at each corner of the courtyard. In a tightly organized geometric pattern, Elongated black stones form flowing braided rivers, rounded whitish gray stones, alternately ground and stars. Function, feeling, and meaning are fused here. Many ideas grew out of this process of defining patterns, which were then worked out in writing and tested in fieldwork, practice, scholarly work, and further photography the two photographs of Dino were key, an example of how built form could intensify the experience of natural processes through an overlay of Euclidean and fractal geometries. So too were the images of Avebury and the Alhambra, and this photograph of a weir in Bath, England. My drawings and written notes describe only what I observed at the time, but my photographs contain things I failed to see and permit me to see new things many years later. Seen together, they enable me to compare the same place at different times or two places that are distant from one another. As I wrote from these images, I saw new things in the images of others, like Paul Clay's paintings, Tree Nursery, and Highways and Byways, and heard new things in other authors' words, like T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets and John Dewey's In Art as Experience. The first public formulation to emerge out of this enterprise was The Poetics of City and Nature, a lecture in the series Models and Mirrors here at MIT, organized by Dean John DeMancho in 1986. The printed version, Poetics of City and Nature Toward a New Aesthetic for Urban Design, appeared two years later in a special issue of Landscape Journal on Nature, Form, and Meaning, which I edited, and was reprinted the next year in Places. I continued to use photography as another way of telling, to borrow John Berger's term, but more deliberately to explore and test ideas in the field, and then later to reflect on and clarify them. Looking, thinking, and writing about the poetics of landscape attuned me to the stories landscapes tell. Landscape is loud with dialogues, with storylines that connect a place and its dwellers. The shape and structure of a tree record an evolutionary dialogue between species and environment, and dialogues between a tree and its habitat. A coherence of human vernacular landscapes emerges from dialogues between builders and place, fine-tuned over time. They tell of a congruence between snowfall and roof pitch, between seasonal sun angles and roof overhang, wind direction and alignment of hedgerows, cultivation practices and dimensions of fields, family structure, and patterns of settlement. Built landscapes may be rhetorical. Landscape features, like hill and street, may be emphasized or embellished for effect, slopes steepened to make climb difficult, street broadened and lined with trees to impress the viewer, features enlarged to make a person feel small. Gardens of illusion, reflect oral and written literature, as the pastoral landscape of cemeteries alludes to biblical pastoralism. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. Landscapes are the world itself and may also be metaphors of the world. A tree can be both a tree and the tree, a path, both a path and the path. Gradually, I came to realize that the poetics I sought to define applied to all landscapes, not just urban landscapes, and to buildings too, and that defining such an aesthetic theory demanded first the description and codification of a language of landscape. Field work in Australia and discussions with architects there in 1988 and 1989 were key to my emerging ideas about landscape as a form of language born out of living. Landscape was the original dwelling. Humans evolved among plants and animals, under the sky, upon the earth, near water. Humans touched, saw, heard, smelled, tasted, lived in, and shaped landscapes before the species had words to describe what it did. Landscapes were the first human texts. Clouds, wind, and sun were clues to weather. Ripples and eddies were signs of rocks and life underwater, as caves and ledges were promise of shelter, leaves guide to food. To know the language of landscape is to read a forest, field, town, and city, and tell the stories of their making. To read the world not as a collection of separate things, but as dynamic associations. To practice the art of managing complex living systems. In Aldo Leopold's words, to think like a mountain and seek to escape the short-sightedness the human lifespan imposes. The language of landscape can be read, inscribed, and imagined. To read landscape and to inscribe it is a strategy of survival, to create refuge, provide prospect, grow food. To read and shape landscape is to learn and teach, to know the world, to express ideas and influence others. Landscape as language makes thought tangible. Landscape is scene of life, cultivated construction, carrier of meaning. Through it, humans share experience with future generations just as ancestors inscribed their values and beliefs in the landscapes they left as a legacy, a rich load of literature, natural and cultural histories, landscapes of purpose, poetry, power, and prayer. Landscape is pragmatic, poetic, rhetorical, polemical. Landscapes encompass gardens, buildings, cities, and regions, not mere scenery. They are partnerships between people and place, a mutual shaping that reflects the character of the place and the identity of the individuals and societies who make it their home. Danish landscape German Landschaft and Old English Landscape combine two roots. Land means both a place and the people who live there. Skebe and Schaffen mean to shape. Suffixes scape and Schaft, as in the English ship, also mean partnership, association. Still strong in Scandinavian and German languages, these original meanings have all but disappeared from English. But to have no word for such a partnership is dangerous. In Steps to an Ecology of Mind, Gregory Bateson distinguishes between working hypotheses and those derived from fundamental principles. He stresses the importance in research of thinking and arguing both inductively from data to hypotheses and deductively to test hypotheses against knowledge derived by deduction from the fundamentals of science or philosophy. One must start, he says, from two beginnings, each of which has its own authority. The observations cannot be denied, and the fundamentals must be fitted. In describing and defining a language of landscape, I worked from observations recorded in photographs and field notes to hypotheses on the one hand and on the other examined their fit with certain fundamentals of my own profession, landscape architecture, and of related disciplines, art, architecture, anthropology, ecology, geology. My camera was a tool of discovery. It focused my observations. 
photography was a means to test and revise working hypotheses and to explore the fit with fundamentals, which demanded that natural processes and human purpose be integrated, that basic physical, social, and spiritual needs be addressed, that the ideas embrace both artful and everyday expression and apply from the scale of the garden to the scale of the region. Photography as a visual way of thinking was particularly valuable in working out ideas about a nonverbal form of language. Also important in testing whether ideas were borne out by historical evidence and whether they worked in practice. Here photography also played an important role. Photographs by others were historical records and photographs by my students and myself documented the processes and products of practice. For example, a typical record of before and after. From 1987 on, the West Philadelphia Landscape Project and classes associated with it at the University of Pennsylvania were places to test ideas through practice. As a documentation of practice, the photographs of West Philadelphia's Mill Creek neighborhood and the West Philadelphia Landscape Project are quite different from those I make in other contexts. Hundreds of snapshots document a different form of research and mode of engagement. Like my other photographs, they are a source for reflection and writing. I make them primarily for my own use. Unlike Camilo Vergara and Martin Krieger, I'm not creating an archive for others to use. My students made photographs also, and we gave cameras to children who photographed our work together, documented their accomplishments, and created a website that features their own images and texts. Wendy Ewald's description of her work with children and photography made me regret a missed opportunity and recalled how one year a group of my students enlisted the children they were teaching to help them with their research on the neighborhood. My students gave three children disposable cameras and a journal and asked them to take notes. The children brought back amazing images, an improvised basketball court, the sky. In their notebooks, recorded observations at different times of day, what they heard, saw, smelled, while the photographs stand on their own, the notes amplify what the children saw. Picture this, a room full of children of diverse ages, reading, writing, doing homework, a safe house, the photographer told us. Image and explanation gave new meaning to the signs, safe house, that I had noticed in the front windows of certain houses. A photographer's field notes are revealing. This is certainly true of Dorothea Lang, whose day books, as she called them, reflect her preoccupations not only with people and their stories, but also with buildings as distinctive original American forms and with the larger forces shaping lives and landscapes. In 1939, Lang and her husband, Paul Taylor, published An American Exodus, A Record of Human Erosion. We use the camera as a tool of research, they wrote in the foreword. Upon a tripod of photographs, captions, and text, we rest themes evolved out of long observations in the field. Later in life, Lang called the camera a great teacher and described how its use opened up for people the possibilities of the visual world. The camera can find its way through a chain of events very marvelously, she said, if you hold on to the thread, if you hold on to that thread. She was referring here to composing a series of photographs that has sentences and paragraphs and builds to a whole. In 1939, Lang began to group her photographs and to write general captions as backstory, using her field notes as source material for the more polished text. With these photographs and the accompanying text, Lang told a story of Aragon, Oregon, the railroad that put the town on the map and linked it to distant markets. And a man and a wife who came there from Idaho in 1919 cleared the land from sagebrush 
and raised 10 children here. She made these photographs in central Oregon on her way from Portland to the Vale Owyhee Irrigation District in eastern Oregon, where she had an assignment from the federal government to document the Vale Owyhee Irrigation Project. Later that same day, Lang also stopped at this one-room school in Baker County. These and other unpublished texts and photographs from 1939 are presented in my forthcoming book, Daring to Look, Photographs and Notes from the Field by Dorothea Lang, published by the University of California Press. Months of immersion in Lang's photographs and texts of 1939 led me to wonder what had become of the places and the people she portrayed. I didn't want to re-photograph what Lang herself had photographed to produce matched pairs of then and now, but I wanted to discover the terrain she traveled through, what she saw, and what she did not see. The difference between my eye and her own, and what the lesson of that difference might teach me. The journey took me to places I might never have gone, to people I would otherwise never have met. California's San Joaquin Valley in March, the lush farms and woods of the Willamette Valley in Puget Basin in May, back and forth across the Cascade Mountains to the forests of the Idaho Panhandle, and the drylands of the Klamath Basin, the Yakima Valley, the Columbia Plateau, and Eastern Oregon, where I took this photograph not far from where Lang stopped to photograph the one-room school. Following Lang's tracks, her photographs and texts in hand, I found that much has changed, but much is the same. I saw in 2005 poverty as bad as the poverty Lang had seen in 1939. The struggling small towns Lang had photographed still steam, seemed to be struggling. In Nyssa, Oregon, the sugar company that opened in 1938, the year before Lang photographed it, had just closed the year before I got there. The streets and sidewalks of Nyssa are immaculate. Some of the stores have signs in Spanish. Some are vacant, yet well-maintained, like the Hotel Western, where there are curtains behind clean windows, an American flag and patriotic display in the otherwise empty first floor. Across from the vacant hotel, I spotted a sign Lang photographed on the side of the Owyhee Irrigation District Office, a building that was once a bank. I pulled out her photograph and saw Owyhee Irrigation District in big block letters. Beneath is a plea Nissa and community depend on your loyalty, patronize home merchants. And under that are 24 outlines of boxes, each with the name of a local business. Today the sign is faded but legible, and the boxes that once displayed the names of local merchants are blank. The Owyhee Irrigation District office is still here. I stood on the spot where Lang photographed what was then the world's longest siphon, five miles long, eight feet in diameter. My eye followed the line of the siphon that carries piped water across the Malheur River Valley to Dead Ox Flat. I made a photograph that looks much the same as this one from 1939. The farmers with whom Lang spoke in 1939 were struggling, and many of the farms on Dead Ox Flat today look as though their owners still are. In Western Oregon, Lang told the story of a family from New Mexico who settled on 80 acres of uncleared cutover land in a district called Michigan Hill. They grubbed out 80 acres of stumps, built a house, and planted the fields. All the children worked. Today, where the Arnolds had cleared their stump form, the woods are at least 30 years old, possibly 40. Many farms had lasted no more than 20 years. There are few farms now. On former stump land cleared for farms, trees have sprung up around barns, old trailers, ramshackle, ramshackle houses and sheds, and vines have grown over piles of old cars and tractors. When the government loaned money to people to resettle on infertile land or on farms too small to support a family, that did not abolish rural poverty. Lang was a gifted author, as well as a great photographer. 
There's hardly anything I've done that couldn't be enhanced and fortified by the right kind of comment, she told an interviewer in the early 1960s. All photographs can be fortified by words. Your viewer, she said, and he is a very mysterious person. You have to keep him in mind always, and you don't know him. My hope would be that he would say to himself, oh yes, I know what she meant. I never thought of it never paid attention to it, or I've seen that a thousand times, but he wouldn't miss it again. You've told about the familiar, but in telling, calling attention to what it holds, you've added to your viewer's confidence in his own understanding. And the most complimentary thing that anyone could ever say to you is, I saw something today that you would have liked. Then you know you've reached him. My photographs are aids to my own imagination, but I hope they may be so for others, too. One doesn't need to know all that is there to see, but some background enables a deeper, more complex reading. I gave this photograph the title, Fields of Force, Lines of Power, hoping that would provide a clue to darker stories beneath the attractive surface. The long stone wall is an artifact of the Highland clearances, the eviction of people to make way for wool-producing sheep. After the acts of prescription in 1746, Gaelic language and Highland dress were forbidden, and violators punished by being shipped to his English Majesty's plantations beyond the seas, to Ireland, North America, Australia. Scottish Chiefs forced their clansmen off the land to make way for large-scale sheep farming, for deer parks, to raise capital, as Donald Cameron did here in Glen Loy. And look at those furrows beyond the distant fence and the green dots that line them, seedlings of the future forest. This photograph captured a moment in 1978. In 2006, this particular view is no more. Instead of a hillside meadow of heather, we would be looking at a forest of green fir. But how to launch the eye without shutting down potential readings is a challenge. The dilemma is that too much text can limit the viewer's response. The dialogue between photographs and their captions can serve both author and reader. Two years ago, to accompany Knowing Where to Stand, my exhibit at the MIT Museum, I composed a complimentary exhibit on a website with essays of images and words. It can be reached from my homepage at MIT. A few years earlier, I had also begun to write captions in haiku because the form seemed kindred to the photographs and because haiku captions are suggestive, not definitive. They're clues to what is there. I hope they provide a foothold open up the photographs, and welcome the readers' associations. Earth shadow rising, blue into rose, tide turning, October twilight. Leaves flame in dark ash, volcanic dust fanned by wind, cinder, ring of fire. Sky, earth, correspond, clouds path, an ancient track, a mirrored flowing. Trees hug a homestead, mark its place on open plain, sound of winter wind. Erratic boulders brought by ice, tilled, bound by lime, the wall a landscape. Colors tell Calm's age, siblings sprung from common roots, grove of grass, bamboo. Gathering rare rains, island in a desert sea, red rock, sacred place. Ascent, 
enfolded, giving form to a sorrow that cannot be told. Waves and harbor wall shape dark depths and light shallows, two sides, one surface. Glowing shadows show what is there, hidden and real, eternal threshold. Seamus Heaney compares the poet's role to that of the diviner who perceives through empathy and predicts the presence of something that to others is hidden. The diviner of water, for example, who senses water underground, which can then be tapped by a well. Heaney calls this a gift for being in touch with what is there, hidden and real, a gift for mediating between the latent resource and the community that wants it current and released. Like poetry, both photography and design are powerful means of divining what lies latent in landscape to bring it out, give it form. Words themselves are doors, says Heaney, and so are photographs and designs. The photographer frames a view, bringing certain features into dialogue, excluding others. Through this act of framing, one creates a doorway to enter mentally. Through empathetic design, architecture, landscape architecture, urban design and planning, one can imagine a world yet inchoate with the potential for fusing the traditional and the new, non-human and human, nature and culture. My photographs are messages to myself. They show me what I know and want to understand. Accumulated over years, they're a resource to be tapped. They record a dialogue, what landscape said to me and my response. They speak not in words, but in a language of landscape, which I had to learn. I look at my photographs, and this is what they tell me. The natural and the human are one, continuous, not separate. Landscape is a mutual shaping of people and place, and is itself a form of language born out of living. To see is the linguistic root of idea. For me, it is the seed. Thank you. can see it was a labor of love. There is a visual language that is out there that people can share, and it's 
very clear when you go to China, we don't need any special training to understand um, the Chinese notion of beauty. It's there for us to see. Uh, and we can share that in our design. We can try to strive for it. Uh, and I, I think that, as you say, is kind of the root of visual thinking. We do share this language across, across cultures. And I think anyone looking at these photographs uh, would find them uh, uh, beautiful. So I, the one thing I'd like to thank you for beyond that is raising that subject here in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, in particular, and I, I guess in architecture, we don't talk much about beauty these days in cities. And uh, we always have to have a social and a financial and a this and a that and everything. Uh, but uh, beauty is something that allows our places to transcend themselves and to communicate outward to other people people, other places, other cultures who may be there and experience them. And of course, photography can allow us to carry that across mm -hmm. anywhere. This, this and um, I, I think it, beauty, in a sense, needs to take its place among some of the other values that we have uh, for cities in our conversations and, and thinking about them. So thank you for raising the topic. Thanks. I hope that it's a, a beauty that encompasses things that might be very complex and sometimes at first glance ugly, if you know what I mean. Um, I, well, I just want to add to that that uh, this was very inspiring, both the words and the, and the pictures. And I regret not having had the chance to uh, attend more of uh, the other presentations made in this series. Um, but the question I want to provoke you to respond to has something to do with, uh, at the risk of bringing in one of those categories that Dennis mentions. Um, looking at the posters here of the previous um, presentations, and in particular your own uh, special interest in Dorothea Lange and her work, um, the, the, the sense that I'd like you to comment on is the relationship between your, the truths that your eye and your camera are drawn to and that get emphasized even more so through the poetic language uh, used to accompany them um, seem to be uh, at one end of a spectrum uh, in terms of uh, speaking to uh, some sense of political urgency that that uh, is almost, I would say, inevitable uh, uh, when talking about the relationship between the landscape and human uh, action, and human culture, and human history. Uh, and the other presentations, uh, as represented by the posters, and in particular uh, Lang's work, seems to be very powerfully and very directly about the, they have a very strong political sense that is very right up front in their, in their work. And I'm just wondering uh, if you can say something about your relationship uh, with uh, political topics that uh, are embedded in the landscape that, that you come upon. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in my, my book, The Language of Landscape, spells those out uh, specifically. I included the work. Um, that I do in the photographs that I take in West Philadelphia. Um, I, don't, I don't photograph in the same kind of way in that work. That's a 20-year project that I've been working with a community over the course of those years. And um, it's gone through a number of different phases. But I refer to them as kind of like snap, snapshots. I mean, they are almost like a family album. They're a record of a long-term engagement in a community over time. Um, uh, Sure, if you put those together, they're, I mean, they're very much in the tradition of, of Lang, uh, whereas some of my other photographs are not. They're more in the tradition of a color version of Paul Caponegro, for example, uh, if you know his work. Um, and Lang and Caponegro were both, uh, you know, very early influences on me. Um, Lang, uh, Lang, what is not known about Lang is that she, um, she did many landscape photographs, uh, although always engaged in 
teasing out the processes that were shaping it, specifically political economic processes. Um, but um, uh, as I was saying, you know, I was hoping uh, with the caption to the Scottish Highlands one, for example, uh, to intimate that while it may look very scenic, a scene that many tourists travel thousands of miles to go to the Scottish Highlands uh, and have a vacation, that there are darker stories underneath that landscape. So um, in many of, in definitely in many of my landscapes, uh, photographs, there, there is a political story um, there uh, as well as, uh, as other stories. But I was talking particularly tonight, given the topic of the lecture series, which is about photography as inquiry and sensing, in sensing place, uh, I decided to emphasize the role of the photography as played in my research uh, and writings. And for a long time, it was invisible, uh, except to my students uh, and people who came to my public lectures, because I wasn't able to print my photographs until about um, eight years ago when the uh, um, technology in desktop uh, inkjet printing and Photoshop and uh, all of that came together uh, within the past eight years in a major, major leap. So that then led me to be able to uh, exhibit my work uh, as well as just show it to my students in the classroom. Uh, but the, photo the photographs have always been a very important part of um, not just self-expression and, and self-exploration, uh, but also very definitely a form of inquiry. And I hope that's came through tonight. That was, that was the message I really wanted to come through. As people often think uh, architects and uh, a lot of architects and landscape architects and um, who draw think of photography as something that's not a thinking medium that it's, you know, you just go click. It's a, it's a medium of documentation, not a medium of inquiry. Uh, whereas drawing is recognized as, as being very deliberate and a logical way of thinking visually. Um, but I, I would say that those people who just go click, click, click are being lazy with their camera, you know, and aren't really using it as the tool that it can be. It can be just as, as, um, important a tool for visual thinking as the, as the pen or the pencil. That was literally it. I was writing a, the book. I mean, I, I wrote an introductory essay and an epilogue um, to the book of Lang's photographs and texts from 1939. Oh, oh, okay. Well, um, I, I uh, through being asked to lecture there, or being invited, so I go where the opportunity presents itself. And um, when I get invited, I will often choose to go somewhere to accept a particular invitation because I know that I've always wanted to see Issei or um, Saihoji or you know whatever, and uh, Uluru. Uh, so, and what, when, I, when I go to a place, I usually try to build in, on business, I try to build in at least a day, two days for photography. So, and then I'll ask my host, so what are the interesting places I should see? And uh, it's best if I give the lecture first because then people will come up and say, oh, I know a place you have to go. And that's the best. Because then people are saying, okay. You know, it's like what Lang was saying. When someone tells you, I saw something you would have liked, that's the best compliment. Well, that's what people do. They'll come up and say, I know a place you've got to go. So I say, okay, how do I get there? And they either take me or I rent a car and go there or find some way to go there. And I'm always on the lookout for certain kinds of places like I described. Um, so now I'm much more deliberate, but I literally meant what I said when I said it first, like until I really got engaged in the book on the language of landscape in the mid 80s, um, I, and, and started out as the poetics, 
uh, I didn't know what it was I wanted to know, if you know what I mean. I mean, I was, I got some good photographs sometimes, but I would say I wasn't as directed. My eye wasn't as, as deliberate. Um, so I didn't know really what my subject was at that point, except, you know, broadly people and landscape. That, that's just about everything in the world. Yeah, Dennis. I'm just stopping right now. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You might comment on this. Maybe uh, one of my uh, kind of touchstones on uh, photography and thinking about it as a, a tool of visual thinking, which is really what you're about, is uh, Susan Sontag's essay uh, on photography. Are you familiar with that? I mean, uh, it, to me, just personally, I have no idea what people think about it. Uh, she um, she makes some really amazing statements, which I have always carried with me and, and helped me to, I think, understand some of the things we're saying. Um, the, the first the first thing she she argues is exactly what you said that um, uh, photography is a work of nature and art. She says it slightly differently. She she basically says it's another form of reality. Basically. That the photographs uh, are not our objects, they're things we can carry around, I mean, or at least when we used to print them, you know. Uh, uh, but they're also a stencil of the real, which is really interesting. So they have their own reality, yet they reflect on what is a a actually real. But then she goes on to say that our perception of what is real is actually altered by the photographs. And that the more we look at photographs, for a collection of photographs, the more our expectation of what we want in the real world is altered. So there really is this kind of dialogue between the photograph as a medium and what we understand, how we look at the world, how we how we perceive the world that is very unconscious uh, and happening. Of course, advertisers know this really well, uh, but uh, you know it's hard not to look at these photographs and not begin to see the world. A bit uh, uh, differently. Well, that's a book that annoys me greatly. <laughs> and I, I am writing The Eye is a Door because I just can't stand it. You know, I can't stand her description of photography. It is so ignorant uh, to, to say that, the, that photography is the only art where a work of art is produced in the, by the click of, of, of an instant, but the click of the shutter is just so ignorant. She's, she's, doesn't, she's never, and she brags that she doesn't take any photographs herself. So she knows nothing about the practice of photography. I think that she criticizes photographers and skewers them in some pretty, you know, well-timed digs, but, and well taken. But um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a real fan of John Berger, uh, about looking, uh, another way of telling, um, Ways of Seeing was his, you know, first a very slim book. But uh, I think About Looking, Sense of Sight, Another Way of Telling are just great books. And there's so much deeper understanding about photography than Suntag. When when um, Berger decided he wanted to write about photography, he found a photographer to teach him how to use a camera. And so that's how Jean Moore and uh, John Berger's, they're co-authors of Another Way of Telling, um, that's how their partnership started, is that John Moore is a photographer and was showing you know, Berger how to photograph. And so you know, when, you read, when you read Berger, he at least has some understanding of what, you know, what, it's, what it's about. Um, and uh, I just find uh, Suntag's perspective so uh, depressing, so negative. And uh, so my, the eye is a door is a rejoinder to on photography, essentially. No, it's more than that, but I mean, that, that really did get me started. You've all been silenced? Well, thank you. Uh, Alex, you don't have a question? About this idea of, it seems to me a lot of 
photographs were just instinctually taken and framed as opposed to really very deliberate and processed. And it is a split, I think, for photographers yeah. between deliberating over their subject and this sort of almost subliminal read that you instantaneously see and take. How do you explain that? What was the last question? How do you explain that? How, I, I that, think that it's that it's split? it's it's personality partly. And also subject matter. Um, I'll never forget a day that I was out photographing in Detroit with Camilo Vergara. And I have this kind of, as you have heard, this kind of deliberate, slow, circling thing. And Camilo was taking me around to these places uh, where we really weren't supposed to be. Um, and we'd have to kind of slip through some fences and to get there. And then I'd be you know, taking my time, and he'd be looking around. and you know, seeing somebody coming or something, say, hey, we got to get out of here, you know, and meanwhile, I'm just zeroing in on something. So in that sense, it's, his approach, I think, is very, is probably very sensible for some of the places he photographs. And um, I like to read different uh, photographers' descriptions. I think, for example, street photographers uh, tend to be very uh, intuitive in their very quick framing and, um, they may be deliberative in terms of deciding where they're going to stand uh, or where they're going to go or what they're going to do. But um, I have a sense that it's, um, if you read Bystander, for example, by Joel Meyerowitz uh, and his description of um, Cartier-Bresson and the way that he worked and the way that a um, you know, number of street photographers work, it's, it's this very quick thing. Um, and I've heard you describe the way you work in the airplane, you know, that it's, you're going by and you, the first, uh, you just, you get it. You, you, you don't crop, it's, it's what you see in the frame is, it just clicks. Um, I, maybe I'm just slow. <laughs> but on the other hand, I couldn't, th then on the other hand, actually, maybe I'm in the middle because then they're the guys that carry around these big 8x10 cameras, you know, and 4x5 cameras. I'm working with a little light. Uh, like M6, you know, this little uh, like photojournalist camera. And as a matter of fact, I was at a workshop once of these um, landscape photo photographers, and they were all carrying around this big equipment with these big zoom lenses. And I have my little Leica M6 with a single lens, and they had these big backpacks on with all these different lenses. And by the end of the day, this one guy turned to me and said, you know, I've never seen a nature photographer with a camera like that. Uh, <laughs> so I said, well, may, you know, maybe I'm not a nature photographer. I don't know. But uh, it, I, I find that I need to, though, be light. I, 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 it would be, I couldn't stand working with a 4x5 or an 8x10 you know, on a tripod, and you carry it around, and you sit it down, and you... You know, it's it's a much slower, more deliberative process, I guess. So I got to place myself somewhere in the middle, and and it, it it's it's I there are different ways that people see and work and think, and some people like to move around a lot, and some people, you know, just stand there and consider and think, where am I going to go? You know, I decide where I'm going to stand by actually going there, and standing as opposed to stepping back and surveying the scene. You know, you've described to me many times that you've taken a photograph, and you know there's something there, but you don't quite know what it is. I mean, something's drawn you there. There's a richness. There's a complicated story. And you're drawn to it. And you take many photographs of it. And you know there's detail there to, uh, to evoke. Uh, but you don't quite know the story until you go back and think about it. Uh, and the gift that you have is the appreciation of that and also being able to frame it in such a way that it's stirringly beautiful, you know, as Dennis said. So you combine the richness of story with the richness of the aesthetic. And, and I think that is, I mean, that characterizes Alex's work also. Here he is zipping around in a plane, you know, trying to keep the thing up in the air. 
And meanwhile, he sees these extraordinary things on the ground. And Alex, you know, maybe you're a lot uh, smarter than, than I imagined you could possibly be, but I don't think you realize what it all is until you get a chance to look at it. Am I right? I think that's a large part true, sure, but there is this, this feeling that you instinctively yeah. recognize that, that it's That's what I'm speaking. Go, that's exactly what I'm know, speaking quite to. Really, you know, what it's all about. Right. But it does invoke the feeling within you. Yeah. It's, and, I, th uh, I think that Seamus Heaney's, uh, you know, the divining metaphor is a really good metaphor. When I read that, I really associated with it and responded to it. And, and I was, felt so clever that I'd, you know, written it in my, one of the essays in my book. And then um, I went and was listening to Joel Meyerowitz uh, talk, the photographer Joel Meyerowitz. And he started talking about how he's like a diviner for water and he goes and he, you know, until he feels a tug and uh, goes to where he says where the feeling is strongest. So it's this intuitive notion that if you let yourself have this sort of empathetic openness to what you're seeing, that you're drawn and, 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 and also trust your own eye and your own response that you're being drawn to something you're interested in, you know? So it's your subject. and. You can go, I can go out with, with 16 students on a field trip and everybody scatters and they're, they're all being drawn to different places. And we come back here and put the photographs up on the screen and it's like, you know, maybe you've gone to completely different places. I mean, we, well, no, I mean, you can see that there's a connection, but, uh, I think the, it's important to trust your responses to things and to realize that if something fascinates you and is drawing you in, there's a reason. And you may not know what it is, but that's a gift. When that happens, it's a gift because it, it may not be immediately translatable in, into words. And so if you can just get it. You know, image and imagination are, are linked. Uh, uh, linguistically, and there's just like idea and to see. Literally, idea comes from the Greek and the Greek verb to see. Yeah, I think that actually a very good point about photography in general is that in the process of working visually, it's not only by the photographer himself, but by the viewer, in being able to sort of uh, comprehend uh, the content of the photograph respond to it, you know, there's this, this recognition both by the photographer and the viewer. Um, you said that you're waiting for uh, the moment to come and that uh, uh, your ability to read nature is probably what makes your picture so perfect because you wait for the exact moment when the wave and the clouds and everything is in a way that makes a beautiful picture. But do you ever get these moments uh, also within the cities or like street photographers? That, or is it too fast maybe? Well, you know, I get that feeling when like the photographs I took of the kids, you know, those were taken in a situation where things are happening. It's like the street. You know, you got a you got a classroom of 36 eighth graders. You know, hormones raging. You've got uh, you got four 12 or 14 uh, college students in there with them, and it's all a room that's smaller than this room, and it's like you know lots of stuff going on. And so that's like street photography. I would say those photographs of mine are really like street photography. You just got to grab the shot. Um, but landscape photography, uh, you know, it is similar and yet different because um, I guess it is similar in a way because I do wait when I'm photographing the kids. You know, I kind of see that something's going on. So that anticipation is there too. I'm not photographing all the time. I'm kind of just watching the flow of things. And then you see, hmm, it looks like something interesting is developing over there. And so you just kind of go and you figure out the right place to stand for a while and wait and see if, you know, just gets there. Um, whereas, uh, 
Uh, it's it's uh, it is similar in uh, I suppose in in except you can't I don't want to tell them stop. Uh, and uh, it's, it's often in a low light situation, so I'm using flash you know, in, inside the classroom, unless we're outside doing something. But um, I think that most landscape photographers do spend a lot of time waiting. I, 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 Paul Caponegro was looking through my photographs once and turning the pages and looking at, and he looked at me and he said, you wait a lot. <laughs> So I took it as a compliment, but I figured, you know, here's from someone who waits a lot to someone else who waits a lot, you know, because it's only someone who, who waits a lot that can recognize that you wait a lot. Yeah. Uh, this question about speed and pace, I mean, you know, fast street photographer or someone in the middle like you or someone who has an unreal equipment, do you think that the rate of hits of the great shot is more or less So if you read the descriptions of how he photographed, he used his whole body. Um, I remember, uh, oh, you know, 30, I don't know how many years ago, years and years ago, I looked at Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lange, and Cartier-Bresson. This was maybe like a very long time ago. And I was trying to emulate them without understanding that they were like totally different photographers and that they had chosen their camera and to suit their, themselves and who they were and their subject and the way they worked. So Cartier-Bresson works with a 35 millimeter. Um, Ansel Adams works with this you know, big eight by 10 that he carries around and he's got a station wagon. He had a station wagon with this thing built on top so he could carry around all of his equipment or backpack it up into the Yosemites. And Lang needed the mobility around people. She did. She worked with both the four by five and with the Rolleiflex, the two and a quarter by two and a quarter. So, um, it's it's uh, it's really, I think, uh, some just like some novelists are very prolific, and others only write a few, but they're wonderful. Uh, I, I think it's very personal, and I don't think you can say that somebody's great because they do fewer or more or whatever. It's you know, I mean, as for me, just as a as a consumer of, as a reader of photographs, as a lover of photographs, I'm just grateful for, for the great photographs, however many somebody produces. Oh, you can't say, say how, yeah, behind those are many, probably many others that but didn't. My sense is that that is probably not the case. Well, it depends on the photographer. It really depends. It, it is a matter of temperament, partly, I think. Uh, I, I literally feel that I need to click the shutter in order to, you know, kind of mark my movements. Uh, it's just, that's just the way I work. And I, I couldn't go out with, 12 sheets of film, you know, and a 8 by 10 camera and, you know, no, I was going to get those shots that counted. I, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it, it's temperament. It's no right or wrong, but it's, it's knowing what your, what suits you, what suits your body and what suits your mind and the way you work and fitting the, uh, the, the medium and the uh, equipment to, so it's an extension of who you are because you don't, you don't have time to stop and really think about this. And, you know, the, the camera becomes, I was listening to, people have said in various points during this series that 
when they use a camera, it distances them from the scene that they're in. And for me, it brings me closer and more intimate. I have this sense of connection to what I'm photographing. So I don't really, uh, I, I don't know how to respond to people who say that it, it makes them, distances them, except that maybe they're not familiar enough with the camera, so they're having to think too much about, well, what speed should it be, or what should the opening be? You, you need to get to a point where it's, it's just an extension, you know, of your hand and your eye. I think that's what the street photographers in particular, if you, if, you listen, if you listen to their descriptions or read their descriptions, they're just like that. I mean, it's really literally just, just a part of their body. But it, it's wonderful. One of the wonderful things about looking through books of photography is there are so many different eyes out there. And it's the thing I love about teaching photography, using photography in, in the classroom, is that, it, which I just said, that you know you go on a field trip with students and everyone brings, brings back just six images to share, but those six images are so startlingly different visions. And it's uh, uh, a diversity that we need, and we need its uh, uh, so that difference in temperament, difference in interest, and what people bring back, uh, then it then then they it can be shared. So it's it's just like um, if we if we if we didn't if we didn't have those photographs, we wouldn't know what those people who had taken those photographs saw. And as Lang said, she learned so much from all of those other photographers who saw things she never saw before, and contributed it to her so that she could then. C. I think I'll end with that because that was part of the whole point of the lecture series was to bring some very different perspectives, related yet different perspectives on using photography uh, to sense place and to use it as a form of inquiry. Thank you for coming. <laughs>